All right. Okay, we're good to go. Thank you so much, Robert, for uh, joining us, and want to congratulate you on your 700th book. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a few. It's been a, a wild time, yeah. Yeah, and, and I joked just before we got on, I, I can't say that this is your, your latest, most released book, but it is the brand new one on medicinal mushrooms. You've also just released one, uh, part three, on uh, edible medicinal plants of the Edmonton River Valley. That's, that's incredible. That's kind of a very specific book, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of limiting my audience there, but uh, yeah, I, I always get tired of so that the pictures in most of the guidebooks are so tiny, people can't see them, you know? Right. And so that's the idea of color books with only 50 plants in them, because then you can actually zero in. And yeah. uh, the medicinal mushroom one actually came about for two reasons. One middle of March, I just got the last plane out of Victoria, I think, uh, back home. And, uh, and then the first two months, I felt really locked in. And uh, I thought, you know, I got to do something with all my spare time here. This is like, cr drive me crazy. And so I thought, you know what, this is a topic that's interested me for a long time. I had collected some files on it. And so um, I wanted to get it out there. Um, because because really, uh, I often get, when I give talks, people will often come up and sometimes they're uh, in the health profession, they're a medical doctor or a nurse or a chiro or a, an oncologist or whatever. And they'll say, well, there's no real proof they work. And so that's what this book is about. It's hundreds of double blind placebo control randomized trials including yeah. sometimes thousands of people showing the efficacy of medicinal mushrooms. That's amazing. And, and, and I think you mentioned it, but I'll just kind of emphasize it like human trials, right? Because I, I right. know some of the research is, okay, it does this in mice and does this in rats. And okay, that's great. That's promising that that shows us uh, what is a potential. But uh, as you say, to kind of take that gold standard and uh, yeah, I think that was going to be my first question is, is what motivated you to write, write the book? And, and I knew that was out there because you do, you hear that, especially a lot from the medical profession saying, ah, oh, mushrooms, yeah, there's, there's no science, there's no research. Right. Which, yeah, as you say, is, is not true. And uh, I'm sure you could have compiled a whole lot more, but I have uh, went from, it's, it's from page 105 to about 135. So 130 pages, just, just of the references that you've used. Yeah, there's, there's, I think there's around 500 references, something like that. And yeah. uh, citations are good because people can look it up for themselves. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Cool. And, yeah. And, and the other thing I think that's really, you can't play it both ways. I mean, some of my best friends are medical doctors and, and uh, uh, they're, they have a particular way of being trained in the way they, they operate. And I get that. Um, but you can't pretend that a double blind placebo controlled trial is what you want for proof of efficacy and then deny it. You can't play it both ways, right? <laughs> so, so if the studies have been done, right? And, and, and most of the time it's true. And most MDs and oncologists are way too busy be looking at every journal and they have selected journals they look at. And so, yeah. so, so this is from journals from studies all around the world on some of the probably most 20, 25 most well-known mushrooms that, that most of us are aware of that we go out and either wild harvest or we, we purchase in health food stores. And, and why would you want a certain particular extract of this one as opposed to another and, and the studies that have been done? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Was, uh, what was one that maybe surprised you the most? Or, or maybe actually, I've got two questions. What, what was one that maybe surprised you the most of going like, wow, like that just, just blew your mind? Uh, and what was one that maybe you might have had to have, you know, uh, kind of share in, in reference to, to someone that might have been a, a little bit stubborn around a particular uh, point? Uh, well, I'll do the first one first. Uh, I would say that the thing that intrigued me the most, and actually it was already in the works before I or wrote this book, is a, a mushroom out of Taiwan, uh, Antroidea uh, camphora, or sometimes called Antroidea uh, cinnamon, cinnamonia. Okay. Um, 
And this is a very interesting orange mushroom that grows inside a growingly uh, endangered large tree that is so large, in fact, and the mushroom grows, the fruiting bodies grow inside the tree. Wow. So the tree starts to hollow out and people go into the tree with mining, light, ca mining lights on their head and ropes to get to these mushrooms to pick them in the, in the, in the dark of this uh, inner, inner, inner cave, so to speak. Um, and what I found was that yes, the fruiting body definitely had some interesting process, but the mycelium, the actual myceliated uh, product um, shows amazing medicinal benefits. And I think it's gonna be perhaps the next wave of, uh, of uh, medicinal mushrooms in North America, simply because it can be grown on things like uh, spruce and fir tree chips and things like that. So yeah, so that's what surprised me the most. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I know there's a whole new frontier now with our ability to grow these things out, right? To, to harvest the mycelium. Uh, we're not just reliant on, you know, the fruiting body showing up and <laughs> wild harvesting it. We can grow it. We can utilize the mycelium. And uh, yeah, it's, do you think there is, and, and maybe, maybe you came across in the studies or not, you know, the substrate that you're growing the mycelium on, is, is there a real uh, difference there? Yes. To, yeah, the end result? Yeah, absolutely. There have been studies done uh, trying to optimize what substrates really work best for most medicinal mushrooms. And, and there's quite a variation. Some, some like hardwood chips, some like straw, some like sorghum or millet or rice or wheat or, you know, there's a wide, uh, a, a wide variety. Uh, I would say this, that uh, because the medicinal mushroom world is really uh, specifically geared towards organic, uh, depending on what part of, uh, say, North America you're in, you're going to be more likely to use uh, Douglas fir in British Columbia, and you're going to use sorghum in North Carolina, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so I would say it's re bioregional, uh, but it's starting to grow, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I think uh, New Frontier is, you know, there's, there's one item that we have, it's called Reishi 42, and we call it that because it's grown on a substrate of 42 different medicinal herbs. And they say in their studies, they found unique novel compounds that never showed up in any other type of Reishi because purely of the substrate. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think about 20 years ago or so, uh, they were doing like a stragless uh, which is a stragglers root is a really important TCM herb. Uh, and they had all of this herbage left over. It's like a vetch. And they grew uh, oysters on that. And they again found uh, compounds never before found in nature. So right. that whole area really excites me that the, that the people are starting to investigate that more and more. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, that'll, that'll be your next book, hey? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. All right. Well, so was there anything, uh, maybe that second question that, you know, maybe a commonly held belief kind of within uh, the medical industry, or maybe you had an encounter with someone and, and you know, through this book or uh, just some of the studies you had that you brought to light was like, you know, here it is. Yeah. Well, I think the most important thing is that uh, very often in many many viewers will probably relate to this, that uh, upon the uh, uh, diagnosis of cancer, uh, many me medical doctors and oncologists will tell their patients that they should not be taking any supplements. Right, that's true. Right? That's a very, very, very common. During chemo, because we're going to do chemotherapy and radiation and or both, and it, that the supplements may interfere with the act with the activity of these compounds, these toxic uh, approaches. And uh, what this book in large will reveal is that that is not true. That in fact, uh, taking medicinal mushrooms during and after chemo or radiation not only improves quality of life throughout that particular um, um, degree of uh, uh, of uh, supplement of uh, uh, acti active uh, um, 
like actively looking at uh, giving those particular uh, modalities, but they find that uh, the survival rate uh, afterwards is much higher. In fact, in some cases, it's double. Like instead of a, the four-year usual uh, after cancer survival rate, it could be 10 or 11 years. And wow. so the, to me, that is the thing that the double blinds have been done. That has been proven. Uh, why are oncology centers in Canada and the U.S. not recognizing that and, and, and giving this information to their patients and clients to make up their own mind whether they want to or not? Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that's huge. This, this information needs to get out there. So if you're, if you're just tuning in, you're watching this uh, live on Facebook or you're watching the replay on YouTube, we're talking to Robert Rogers, uh, his latest book, Medicinal Mushrooms, The Human Clinical Trials. Yes, uh, in the range of over 500 uh, references to, as you said, the uh, kind of gold standard of scientific trials, human trials, and it's incredible. Uh, I have not, obviously, yet, because we only just got these uh, last week, so I haven't read it myself, cover to cover, but uh, I've been having a, having a great scan through it and uh, looking forward to really diving in. And, uh, you, you know, you mentioned one more unique mushroom, uh, but most of these, as you, as you said earlier, are things that we can find, you know, fresh, either in, in grocery stores or as supplements in health food stores, or right. many of us are even finding kind of our forays out into the forest. So this is, this is accessible medicine. This is effective medicine. Um, yeah. Very yeah. I, I would say the, uh, of course, like would be expected the, uh, the Ganodermas have the largest number of clinical trials, but, but yeah. But uh, Maitake or Hen of the Woods has numerous. Shiitake has lots, and uh, and and Turkey Tail. Uh, yeah. What I think would surprise many people is because of this ongoing mycelium versus fruiting body controversy. I'm I'm sure you've been in a few of those discussions. <laughs> um, <laughs> that 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 the two most of the studies that have been done on turkey tail particularly in japan with a, a product called psk or creston and in china with psp um, uh, those uh, are fermented mycelium products wow and uh and so people say oh well mycelium you know no no i just like fruiting bodies but most of the studies have been done on those two products which are uh seven to ten, one of them is only a seven to ten day uh, bioreactor fermentation and the other is like uh, less than a week. One of them contain, one of them involves an ethanol um, wash extract at the end. So that's not to say that turkey tail as a fruiting body is not a great medicine, but the, most of the studies that have been done are on, uh, on the, the mycelium type product. Yeah, no, it's good. And, and I'm sure you've mentioned it in places, but I like that you do have references to the study so we can go in, into them because I often wonder that too. Okay, well, when they did the study, if it came to this conclusion, what were they using? Was it fruiting body? Was it uh, yeah. mycelium? What type of extract, hot water, ethanol, at what strength? Um, all those <laughs> factors. So it helps, it kind of steers you in the right direction, but to really get in down into the details, uh, that's, that's super important. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, go, I was just going to say that, yeah, the, one of the reasons I wrote it was that uh, to maybe perhaps unravel some of the uh, controversy, but also just look at what, what does the science say and where could we possibly be going with this next stage of medicinal mushroom? Um, because it is one of the fastest growing categories in, in the health community. Mm -hmm. um, and we should be looking at the uh, and what's really been done and, and how, and look at the science. And I think that's important. Yeah, totally. Uh, the future is fungi. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, um, what would you say within, I, I know obviously within the kingdom of fungi, there are thousands, right? Hundreds of thousands of different varieties. And, and, you know, you and I were joking, <laughs> you know, if it's not edible, it's not medicinal, we don't care. Um, but, you know, of those, right, the ones that we know about, that we've studied uh, to a greater or lesser degree, would you say that, um, you know, 
not only they all hold promise or are they all fairly equal and, and kind of maybe to give a little bit more context to that conversation you mentioned Ganoderma right the the famed ratios had so much studies around it uh, a lot of history of use a lot of enthusiasm around it maybe we can take lion's mane as another example but there are often you know a very similar species so in the case of Ganoderma you have Ganoderma aplanatum uh, not just lucidum, you know, and Dini always mentions, you know, it's like, oh, I bet, you know, like the, the aplanatum is just as good as a lucidum, or, you know, we have the, uh, the bear's head or the coral tooth mushroom uh, from the heresiums, you know, not quite as popular as lion's mane. Do you, do you see mushrooms as, as having those, you know, uh, just as good benefits um, as, as the ones that may be studied, or, or there really is something extra special about reishi or lion's mane? That's a great question. It's a loaded question, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll go I'll address Ganoderma first. Um, most of the um, human trials that have been done are the so-called Ganoderma lucidum species, uh, which doesn't really exist in North America. No. Uh, no. Uh, it was found in the desert in Utah, one species, one time, probably an escapee from a f mushroom factory. <laughs> but we do have, you know, many species in North America, Cecil, Curtsii, you know, Suge, Organense, and the perennial Ganoderma aplanatum. And when you look at the chemistry of all of them, there's a lot of similarity. Right. Uh, now, have the studies been done with those? Only a few. So, in fact, Ganoderma lucidum probably isn't even what was studied in China and Japan. It was probably Sinensi, you know. So, so, yeah, we can get caught up in the nomenclature of the specific binomial, but uh, I would like to see more studies done on the uh, North American species for sure. I, I love Suge and uh, an Oregonense from the co West Coast. But, you know, in my backyard here in Northern Alberta on this side of the Rockies, um, Ganoderma aplanatum, uh, the new growth of it every year, uh, harvested and made into a dual extraction, is a mighty fine medicine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I, yeah, I, I agree. I'm with, I'm with you on that. And, and, can, and, the, and the same with the heresiums, the coralloides, the ramosum, the americanum, all of those types of variations. I'm not sure there's three distinct mushrooms there, to be honest. But let's just pretend there is, uh, that all of those have some very interesting compounds that are um, um, uh, not identical to the uh, uh, compounds that are in the mycelium or the fruiting body of uh, heresium uh, uh, that we're most familiar with, the lion's mane, but, but they're there. And so the studies just have not been done. Although I did this I did find a, one study on each of those that was human, uh, suggesting that probably there is some benefit there and we just need, need to do more study. But, but people may be surprised of how few human clinical trials have been done on heresium. Right. And yet it's popularity uh, spreading uh, empirically by people saying, look, I've tried this for a month and you cannot believe the difference, mm -hmm. right? And so, so at some point we want to do more studies, but uh, and uh, perhaps work at creating a optimal um, product that may include both mycelium and fruiting body. Yeah. I really believe because there's really potent compounds in both of those. Well, why not do an extraction which combines both? Because as as the arisenins, uh, arisenins are are um, finishing up as the, as the mushroom starts to go into the fruiting body, there's none left in the mycelium, but then it con converts into a different compound in the fruiting body. And so you could do both. You could have a combination of ideal ratios. Um, still looking for that quarter of a million Canadian to do a 100 person trial in North America to prove the efficacy of of heresium for cognitive decline. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there. I know there's that that one main study out of Japan that's referenced a lot. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, that yeah. seems to be the kind of. Yeah, the and there's a li and there's a new one just out uh, about a year ago. So, okay. cool. yeah, it's, yeah, it's in it's in there. Yeah, it's in there. You could read about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I'm I'm stoked. Um, uh, how about so we've been talking about the difference between you know mycelium, fruiting body. Uh, where do you stand on on spores? I know that's gotten kind of a lot of attention in, in some research. Did you get into that a lot in this book? And and where do you stand on kind of them as in their efficacy? Yeah. So I found one credible. Uh, spore related uh, uh, study that, uh, associated with Ganoderma and uh, it seemed to have some efficacy but it has not been replicated. Uh -huh. uh, There's only the one study that I found to this point and uh, I'm sure it's potent. I mean this, this is the, the life seed so to speak of the mushroom and, and if you could actually crush that cell wall so you could actually have bioavailability I'm sure it's quite efficacious. And if you look at some of the reishi factories, the amount of spores that are produced that you could, <laughs> that you could scoop off on a daily, it's just tremendous. I mean, yeah. even Ganoderma uh, aplanatum produces like trillions of spores in a, in a six month period of time when it's, when it's uh, not, not snowing in this part of the world. Yeah, I know it's cool. I, I just found some the other day, actually, and it was, it was licking the mushroom and licking my finger. Yeah, everything. yeah. Now, whether, whether those spores actually need to be crushed or not, that, I think, is something that has to be looked into a bit. Yeah. Right. And, and I wonder if, if, you know, a high ethanol extract would do it as well? Doubt it. You doubt it? Oh. Yeah, I doubt it. Yeah, just because those spores are designed to live until an op a very opportune time. Right. And, uh, and I think they, they've done some studies exposing them to high radiation and all kinds of things, and they don't, it doesn't kill them. So <laughs> whether or not ethanol would actually open up, I think mechanically crushing them is probably as good as anything. Right. And, then, and then do a water ethanol or whatever ratio is required, but. I don't know enough to be honest about it. I, I think some of the products out there are crushed spores in oil. Right. Like after they crush them, they put them into an oil base. So, yeah. 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 Okay. You know? It's a new frontier. If anybody out there is watching that wants to uh, take that on. I yeah. know. Yeah. So here, well, that's, what's, that's what's exciting about mushrooms is that there's so many opportunities to participate and share and discover and, uh, and move this whole industry forward. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's here's another one. Here's a new frontier. I know you and I have talked about this a little bit before. And you had described uh, those kind of water droplet-like uh, secretions out of the mushrooms, which which is not new. Let's let's be clear about that. You had described it as gutation. Um, did you come across any studies specifically related to uh, to the gutation? I have not had anyone who has revealed any of the uh, uh, constituents associated with that watery, uh, uh, you know, which kind of that bitter, salty kind of a flavor. Um, and in fact, I, I, I did get a small study here done in Edmonton on it, and we couldn't identify anything of interest. Right. So what I'm thinking is that probably in the case of red belted conch, which seems to be one of the ones that really enjoys doing this, uh, I think it's probably just clearing the channels for, uh, for the for the spores to the dry spores to later release themselves. Right. Get rid of the water that's in the fruiting body. Clear the channel so the dry spores can release. I think. Yeah. Nobody knows for sure. It is an interesting thing, and it, it's not the only mushroom that does that. But but certainly, uh, it is a fascinating thing. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly, it's fun to just lick the mushroom for that anyways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're getting like a mini mushroom essence of red belted conch for that, right? Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> cool. All right, well, I hope uh, everyone's enjoyed our conversation here. We've been talking about Robert's new book, Medicinal Mushrooms, the Human Clinical Trials. Uh, we do, we just got this in at Light Cellars. We have those in store, they're available. We've also got his field guide too. Uh, we, this has been awesome. I've been taking this out on my plant walks. Isn't that handy? Yeah, it's so handy. Waterproof, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, really handy. 
And I, and I love the, uh, these little kind of reference charts too, you know, therapeutic benefits. It just puts it all right together there. Uh, and then of course your, yeah, first edition, second edition of the fungal pharmacy. Amazing. Uh, this is I know some people really enjoyed that first one, you know, like, uh, that was done 2005, I think, or something like that. And, uh, yeah, it's still very popular. It's, uh, certainly more amateurish but it does have lots of good stuff in it it's it and, and i like how it folds back so yeah. it's easy to you know for id right no, yeah totally. uh, the portability of it is is great yeah, and, yeah uh, exactly. it's the, the expanded version where you did add uh, lichens as well uh, to the mix and yeah very excited that this one is out because you know like you said 2005 here we are 2020 you know everything that you wish you could have included back then that was available here it is yeah. well you know i i often get i have been criticized in the past for going putting all the studies both in those both of those two books uh all the in vivo and then all the in vitro you know the test tube studies which right. i find interesting but really that's not about humans. And right. so I thought, you know, why not put a book out that really, to this point in time, probably a year from now, it might need a re-edition, right? Because the studies that are ongoing all the time are ama amazing. Yeah. Uh, just in the last five years. Um, so, you know, hopefully in a few years, I can put this out again as a re-edition, uh, adding, adding in another two dozen or a hundred clinical trials uh, and maybe some other mushrooms that finally get the respect that they're due. Yeah, that's awesome. And maybe you should clarify for everyone, did you limit yourself to a certain uh, date range within this book? You know, it had to be the latest within X amount of time or, or you just drew from the best from uh, this century, this century. Yeah. 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 Cool. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Yeah. Great. Well, I've, this whole time I've been trying to think of like, oh, what, what's a great, you know, like ending question uh, for you here? Uh, do, you, do, do you have uh, any kind of final thoughts or, or, you know, future of fungi where you'd like to see uh, us all go, not only industry, medical professionals, anything like that? Yeah, I think uh, it would be nice if uh, more and more mushroom producers start to, to follow the science a bit and also discover things that we have never known before. For example, uh, the classic stinkhorn, you know, the phallus impudicus, you know, that we see all over. Well, the studies out of Latvia are just astounding. And the one clinical trial that I, uh, and you can get these products on the internet. Um, one of the studies that I found was remarkably effective for the lymphedema that is often suffered by women after they've had, say, breast cancer surgeries, where one of their arms will be get swollen, swollen with edema up to three or four times its regular size. Outstanding results with that product. And wow. I, think, I think people need to know about this. I think it's really important that, that uh, health professionals in general and oncologists start to uh, to take advantage of the fact that they're going to have not only more quality of life while they're undergoing those therapies, but they're going to survive longer. And I think that's really important that information get out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for doing uh, your part to uh, yep. help get that information out there. And uh, we'll, we'll help get it out here in our own way through Light Cellar. So really appreciate yeah. that. And uh, how can folks find you to connect with you? order books from you let us let us know well i think they should get their books through you i really appreciate that you have in calgary there a uh an incredibly beautiful store and uh and you've been educating people there about mushrooms for a long time and you have extracts and and powders and capsules and everything down there um but they can get a hold of me through i have a website uh www self s-e-l-f self heal distributing.com that's where my wife's and my books are all available and uh, for the Edmonton people that's probably a great idea uh, if you're in the States uh, probably just go to Amazon because the price of sending books across the border is just prohibitive it's yeah. crazy ridiculous right and then length of time it takes nowadays too so right. no, yeah, it's but, true. In, but in Calgary go see Malcolm 
in Edmonton, see Lori and I. Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. Are your books through Amazon? I know mine is. It's a, it's a print on demand as well, which is pretty nice these days. So if someone yeah. orders it, it gets created and shipped to them. Yeah, that's. I think that's a great way to go. I, uh, you know, uh, um, the author gets a little bit more royalty than they do through the mainstream, right? Right. Like, like my large fungal pharmacy. I can't retire on the royalties I get from that. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad it's a beautiful book. But yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, we, we love that it's out there. So, all right. Well, thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon. And uh, yeah, everyone give Robert a follow here on Facebook. And uh, we're going to have you back on. I know in the fall, we're going to keep having more conversations. Uh, probably the next one we'll talk about is uh, your book about the, uh, the Cree healer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, right now we're we're looking for funding to uh, to do a documentary on on Russell Willier and the Cree Healer in this medicine bundle, and so that we're trying to put that together. It seems like it's coming now, uh, and uh, we'll do filming next summer for that. I I think it's uh, he left a legacy that needs to be captured in more ways than just a book form. So. Yeah. yeah. So we'll talk later. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll, we'll chat again soon. Thank you, Malcolm. Take care yeah. of yourself. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.